excited to share with you the topic of what we're going to be going through is what's changed about prospecting. It's a lot's different now. Obviously, we're dealing with a lot more on camera sales versus going door to door or doing phone calls. But what I want to start unpacking today, are what are the trends that we've been seeing actually be successful? And what are the trends that used to be pretty good, but aren't really working out anymore? How we'll go through that is the first thing is just a brief overview of what has changed? What is our perspective of it? I'd love to hear from you as we go through this, anything that you want answered or what you've seen change, start a little dialogue. Then we'll go into communication best practices, specifically on how to change your communication based on executive level. Then we'll go into research, which I think is a little bit underused these days, but we'll see how to apply that research. And I'm sure as things come up, we can talk about other things like objections versus deflections, where sequencing fits in, and then some advanced trends that we're seeing. Like if all of this that we've talked about so far is super easy to you and you want to know like, what's that next thing that I can do? We'll get into that. So first, let's get started. The biggest thing that I've seen change is that there's that debate that's been going on on should we do cold calls or not? And it's not a debate that I love hearing about because the issue of communication is not what you feel comfortable as the salesperson. If you like jumping on the phone or texting or writing an email, communication is all about what the other person is understanding of what you say. And some people prefer calling versus texting versus email. So that means you, as somebody who's in sales or doing prospecting, needs to communicate in many different channels, some that you like to do more and some that you probably don't like to do as much. But the issue that I've seen is that a lot of us are looking for quick wins. And it makes sense. Like as humans, like we are designed to always take the easy way out. Why would you spend extra calories doing something when you could do it for cheaper, for easier? And with that, we often come into the issue of templates. Now, as the market has shifted, when I got into sales, it was like around 2008. And this was on the boom of the great 2000 dot com era crashing and then starting to rebuild. And when you were able to send out emails at scale, it was a little bit revolutionary. Now we take it for granted. But early days, when you could try and fake personalization through sending a template, like writing in high first name, then you made it feel like this was something that you actually had to manually type out, which inherently was valuable. But today, these templates are getting completely abused. And as we're all feeling it, there's the layoffs being announced. I saw 13K jobs from Meta just was released. Like, it's dramatic. And we are lucky if we're employed right now, we are lucky to have the job. But we also need to recognize that what was working before, when people had a lot of money, when the economy was booming, is not working now. And one of the biggest things that I see change is our reliance on templates. I worked uh, for training a company that was based on video recording software. Well, not saying the name specifically, but they came from the old school approach. They were sending out a hundred emails a day, a hundred calls a day. And this spray and pray mentality, they were probably converting 2% or so. I, I think that's pretty much like ballpark for what you should expect for that type of spray and pray attitude. But what we try to convert is a more customer centric attitude. And I want to just set this in context in case anybody's brand new to winning by design, what we mean by the bow tie. On the left side, we have leads come in. In the middle, we have deals being closed. And on the right side, we have growth through customer success, expansion, renewal, resale, cross sell, et cetera. What we are going to be focusing today is this middle part of the left side of the bow tie. This represents customer education. Education is where somebody is already aware that they have a problem, that's marketing's job or ABM strategies, account-based marketing, versus selection mode, which is where sales happen. That's typically discovery call through close. The context of what I would like to describe is Prospecting typically happens when somebody's like vaguely aware or a lot aware, and they're trying to get into that conversation with a true sales professional and they're ready to commit more time to evaluating what's right. So when I say that we're talking about templates, this is when you're trying to start a relationship with somebody. And just like making friends out of college, like 
I, I hope I'm not alone with this, but it's, it's been hard for me to make friends out of college. Like college is easy. And that's kind of like inbound prospect. And college is like, you're surrounded by everybody. You're super excited to be there. Like you're open to new experiences. But now, like I got two kids at home. Like my time is very valuable. My mom is lucky if I give her a call once a week. I'm like, I could be better at that. But like, ah, there's a lot going on. So to risk my time with somebody new is something that I'm a little bit hesitant for. And so that's why building relationships and prospecting has to kind of mirror that value exchange. When you're prospecting somebody who doesn't know you, you're asking something from them before they know if you're gonna provide any value. And this is a lot of the friction that happens whenever we start a relationship, whether it's an executive or a director or manager level, we all feel this as humans. Where do we connect with people? And one of the things that you can do to influence somebody to want to talk to you, to make somebody like you, is to make it about them. Show that you've done research in them. If you're asking for something from them, such as time, show that you've already invested time in getting to know them or their business. And so now this taps into how do we start our communication? What are some of the best influence best practices? So I'd love everybody to throw it in the chat right now. What are some of the best communication tips that you have to start a relationship so that somebody wants to talk to you? Whether it's email, a LinkedIn message connection, or a phone call. And we can call that cold calls or unscheduled. I'll get that in there. But everyone start blowing up the chat right now. What are some of the best practices that you know of that you can communicate to start a conversation with somebody? Introvert versus extrovert. I used to call myself an ambivert because I can turn it on sometimes, but like my gut reaction, my, actually I heard a really funny phrase as I'm letting this chat populate. I just heard of, it's not FOMO, but JOMO. And I kind of have JOMO, which is joy of missing out. When I know that like people are hanging out and I'm not there, like when I'm feeling introverted, like I like being able to be home and doing some stuff around the house or play with the kids, all the people out. My wife, complete extrovert, you get super energized by going out there. So yes, I agree there needs to be some sense of the two. Jomo is real, yes. Okay, good, I'm glad I'm not alone on that. Um, unscheduled call, I only call friendlies, okay. LinkedIn messages, letting them know you need something you are related to, like, or share. Okay, what we're starting to realize is people care first and foremost about themselves. We all value what's in it for me. And so if somebody writes you a templated email, calls you out of the blue, and it's very clear they don't know anything about you, you want to block them because you already know they're going to ask you for something without giving you much value in return, or at least the value is risky. You don't know if it's worth it or not. So the way to get over that is by starting to think about applying research within your communication. And so there's techniques that we can do that with emails. Just writing something like, hi, first name. Uh, this is like what a snippet should be. So let's say it auto-populates. Hi, first name. I noticed that you were title at job. We as humans are so good at finding patterns. The first time you get an email like that, you're like, oh, cool. They sent me an email. They know something. The 50th time you get an email like that, you like immediately mark as spam. Like I'm clearly on somebody's radar. I don't need to be there. And I am getting blown up these days with spam LinkedIn messages. Usually LinkedIn was a little bit safer because it wasn't easy to auto-populate there now. But now I am on certain people's sequences on LinkedIn. That's like, I really want to build my network. Can you find some time, 20 minutes to discuss how we can potentially find value? And they're trying to do it in the right way. Their intent is to say like, hey, like let's do something together and let's see if we can do something. But the value exchange is wrong. For somebody like me that's creating content, like I know that I can deliver them value, but what am I gonna get out of this conversation? But it's completely different if they go to my profile and they call something out about, hey, I saw on your recent LinkedIn post how you announced this. I think this article would be value for you. Do you think that this is something that you would share with your network or share with your team? Like, are you into learning development? Are you into posting more on LinkedIn? If there's something like that and they're giving me something of value, like, 
I already like this person. If they're giving me a compliment. Now, obviously anybody who creates content has a little ego behind it. So if you give them a compliment about something they created, that immediately makes them like you a little bit more. And the reason I'm giving you these tips is as you're researching somebody, you can try and find three things in three minutes. The reason I time box it with three minutes as a prospector is it is so easy to go down the rabbit hole in LinkedIn. Like all of a sudden, like I'm researching a CEO of a company that I want to go into. And then I see that they're connected to somebody at my school. And then all of a sudden they're connected to like my ex-girlfriend. And I'm starting to like, and I get like super deep down. I'm like, wait, how did this happen? And the reason this happens is all social networks are rooted in trying to just keep you on the network. But you as a sales professional, time is your most important asset. And so you can't be wasting a lot of time. So if you start time boxing how you do your research and try and find three things in three minutes, that will trick your brain into staying on task. What are you trying to do in those three minutes? You don't need to do things that are finding out like basic things that they already know. We call those situations. Situations. For example, if you know that I work at Winning by Design and my title is Chief Learning Officer, and you put that into a message to me, that's not particularly interesting because I already know what company I work for. I already know my title. What is interesting if you go down to the next layer, which is pain. What are some of the things that you think I might be struggling with based on my persona? And you mentioned something like that. Now, if you don't know anything about me, you can go to the website, but I wanna give you a quick tip on as we blend how to communicate and how to research, I wanna start talking about the different personas in play. I tried to coin this term a couple of years ago and it did not catch on. I'm still gonna say it today, but I'm gonna call this the title totem pole. At the very top, you have C-level executives. Then you have VPs who report into them, directors and managers, et cetera. As you go down the title totem pole all the way to, I don't like calling people users, but like whoever would like use the tool at the bottom. So I guess users is what I should call it. But there's a difference in what people care about, the types of pain that they have based on the job that they're doing. And when you communicate to different people, we have to go back to that first principle we talked about is people ultimately care about themselves. What's in it for me? So when you communicate back to them, make it about what they care about, what their pain is. And that's why templates don't work. You can't send the same template to a C-level as you would to a manager level because they care about completely different things. C-level right now is struggling with the macroeconomics. We know like what, whatever business that you're in right now, things have changed in the last six months. Now, don't even mention the election that we're still trying to figure out what the results are. Macroeconomically, things are changing. Energy is in crisis, tech is in crisis. So as you talk to C-level, the strategy that they started off the year with is probably significantly different than the strategy they're worried about going into 2023. You as a prospecting professional can use that to your advantage. I know when I first started prospecting, I was super worried about talking to C-level executives and being like, I have no value. I just started this job. Who am I to advise somebody in a senior role about what they could do? But as I developed my skills, I started realizing that I have something that all C-levels value. If I were to co-call a C-level person as a prospector selling communication software, email software, IT infrastructure, I have something of value based on even if only a couple months of experience that they would care about. Can anybody guess what that would be? Try and put that in the chat or go off mute if you're feeling bold. Think of two months in the job. A solution? I hope so. Yes. You hope that you have the solution for the person you're talking about. That's on the right track. A fresh perspective. Yes, it's getting closer. Specific product knowledge, even closer. I like what we're building towards. Because I mentioned at the very beginning, talking about building out new relationships, is that when I first started getting into sales, I was like, hey, I'm going to be better at my product than anybody else, except for the engineers who actually built it. But like, I'm going to know the ins and outs. If somebody asks me a question, I don't want to send them over to support. I want them to talk to me. 
But the problem that that had is I started getting into the weeds with almost every call. I started telling them the ins and outs, how cool everything was, but it was all rooted in my perspective. Ultimately, when you make it about what they care about, the pain that they're trying to solve, you need to do that in the minimal amount of words as possible. You need to be succinct with what you're saying. And if you're a C-level executive, they're short on time. And so being even more succinct is important. So when you get to the point with who you're communicating with, the trick that you're trying to do is you wanna share about how others like them are solving the problem. This is the value that everybody on this call right now can immediately provide to an executive. You do not need to do what younger version of Dan did. Well, actually, I probably still do it by accident, but like, you know, you flex, you try and be like a little bit like smarter or better than you are, like more knowledgeable because you like want to come across as an expert that they can trust, which is all the right intent. But you can do that more effectively through a third party reference or what we used to call or not used to, we still call storytelling. A really powerful skill in communication is talking about somebody else in a story format because it tricks the brain. It tricks us all. Like the reason we love stories is we see ourselves in the shoes of the main character. So if you're talking to a C-level executive, you don't need to say like, hey, I know how to do your job better. You say, hey, I was working with another C-level executive like you. Now, specifically, you can be more um, accurate with what you're saying. CEOs like to hear from other CEOs. CTOs care about other CTOs. CFOs, etc. So if you start researching, what story would you tell if you're about to get on a call with a CFO, look up a case study or talk to a CSM on your team or another AE who worked closely with an account that's similar and try and figure out what was the pain that they were trying to solve and then share how that person had a similar pain. Ask the CEO, is this something that you're currently dealing with? And then share how that other person solved it. When you get to this part, this is the trick of advanced prospecting. How quickly can you start pointing people to impact? Now, I know I'm getting kind of the bottom of my board. Can everybody still read that or am I going off? Okay, thank you for the nods. All right, so impact is what we're trying to drive towards, but you have to build to it. You can't just start off and say like, I have the solution. I can have a big impact on your team because that's also a super big turnoff. Whenever you start talking to somebody and you're like, oh, I can help you save X amount of dollars or I can help you hire this type of person. It's like, you're assuming you know something about them. And this gets into the trap that I lovingly convert back to the medical profession is prescription before diagnosis is malpractice. If you tell somebody you have the solution before you figure it out, what their particular problem is, it doesn't even matter if you're right. They're going to reject what you say because it doesn't feel like it's about them. It comes back to what's in it for me. What do I care about? And I think this is something that has been lost recently in prospecting. We're so focused on how do we scale our time? How do we get those meeting converts or the things that I'm being measured on? But really what we need to spend our time on is how do we make it helpful and drive to impact for the customer that we're talking to? How do we make them feel special that this is about them, whether or not we make it scalable? And so I shared with you, I started telling the story about that prospecting team that was doing the spray and pray. Once we went through the training, actually I'll name drop the person who worked there. I worked with Beck Holland. She had just gotten hired as an SDR manager and she's an incredible leader and now an incredible thought leader on prospecting. But I remember when we first started working together, she always joked with me after, she's like, you said a line in a training that really stuck with me. You said to the current like director of SDRs, are you married to that solution? Are you married to that process? And she always thought that was a really funny phrasing of how I said it, because ultimately what happened is we started talking about customer centric sales. We started talking about the bow tie, how to make it back to impact. And if you're really trying to get recurring impact, it starts with solving a problem and not just selling something that they might not need. And so what they ended up doing is started, instead of writing out 100 emails a day, dropping it down to five to 10 emails a day, they would start doing more research and spending their time saying like, all right, who is the persona that I want to reach out to? What do I think the top one or two problems is that person cares about? And how do I write that into an email that's not just personalized with their name and title, but relevant to what's going on with their work right now? So I want to pause there and I hope that this starts capturing some of the essence of what's changed, why communication and thinking about it in terms of what they care about, what's in it for me, 
and how to change it from sea level versus different levels in research. Are there any questions for me before we move on to the next step? Actually, I'll pause now, um, Sari, maybe you can help me out because I've lost the ability to speak and go on chat at the same time. Yeah, I haven't seen any questions pop up, but if anyone wants to unmute and ask a question now, go for it or feel free to pop it into the chat. I have a question. Oh, go ahead. Uh, one question I had um, was, I really like your setup. I think uh, the, the the dry erase approach is, is really cool. I was just kind of curious what tool you were using to do that. I know the magic's a little bit gone right now, right? As you see me like rub something <laughs> in thin air, but yes. Um, I know, I knew it was gonna come up, but let me just spend one second. I was like, I'll just tell you at the end what it is. I'm just gonna tell you right now, cause if I don't tell you, I'm sure a lot of you will be like, hey, like stop delaying the inevitable. And this is a good sales technique. If you ever get asked a question, like how much do you cost? The worst thing that you could, what I was trained on, which I do not think is applicable anymore. I think it's aggressive to say the worst because I'm sure there's worse things to do is to try and deflect it. Old school selling would be like, all right, you can't tell them price before you've proved value. Ultimately, salesperson's role has shifted like from the 70s where we are not the information gatekeepers anymore. Like everything's available on the internet. If they ask you how much your price is and you don't tell them, like they're gonna go find out ballpark from somebody else or they'll just be like, oh, if you're not talking to me about it, like I don't trust you, like it's probably way too expensive. I'm not even gonna go to the next step. So if somebody asks you a question, like what is this fancy tech setup that you do? And you don't answer it right now, you're all gonna be like, hey, this guy's a little shady. So here's me. I'm standing on another piece, or I'm standing across from a glass, piece of glass. And then over here is my camera. The special part about like what makes this thing work is that this glass has LEDs with light facing into the glass. And so when I write on it with this pen, it, the ink pops. And so I get this really cool like illumination that you wouldn't get with like a normal whiteboard. But to do it live like this, what you have to do is add a polarized lens here. And I did so many experimentations to figure it out, but like, this is the cheapest part of the whole setup. It's like 10 bucks to put on a polarized lens. And what's cool about that is I have a big TV across the room, like behind my thing, but the polarized lens blocks out the reflection on the glass back into the camera. And so now I can keep the magic alive. And then the real thing is you gotta get like a dark room and some like fancy light magic around you so you don't see other reflections, but that's basically how it works. And then I use OBS, which is a free open source, like the gamers on Twitch made it popular, but like I just use that to flip the camera um, and mirror it so I don't have to actually write in backwards. So anyway, that's how I use in a very like minimal amount of effort. The tool is called a light board. Um, it's super fun, but it's kind of not that easy to set up, but anybody who wants to get started with it, like super support you in doing it. Let's go to Rahul first and then Josh. Thank you. Yes. Uh, hi, Dan. Hi, everyone. Um, just was curious, like to get at a prospect situation, pain and impact. Do you think developing personas is useful or is it better to go like, you know, case by case doing that three in three minutes per person? I, my intuition is probably the second one, but I'm wondering if personas even you know, oh, personas are huge. Yeah, no, your intuition on the first thing that you suggested is like spot on. And especially, so if you're going in and let's say you're just starting off like a startup job and like you're the first salesperson there, that's going to be way different than if somebody's hit go to market fit or even product market fit. Like if you know how you can help somebody, your personas can be more specific. But if you're just trying to figure it out, you have to be a little bit more vague. And then you just focus on your successful customers. How do I get more of those early days in those types of sales roles? Like any dollars you can bring in, like awesome. As you get more mature and you get more different specific sales cycles going on through the bow tie, then you have to narrow it in and have different sales specific processes for it. SMB versus mid-market versus enterprise, but all in all persona, uh, stereotyping has that negative connotation to it, but like it's somewhat similar to that. Someone like similar industry that they're in, similar title that they have, similar customers that they work with or similar solutions. Like all of those are ways that you could find patterns to be relevant. To be honest though, C-levels, like they all think they're special 
people. Like every C level person I've talked to is like, my company is unique in my situation. And it's like, okay, but you still have to do a little bit more research like for the higher end of it. But as you go down the title totem pole, you can be a little bit more scalable. You can assume that most managers at similar types of companies at similar size are probably struggling with the exact same thing. It's a, a complicated question you've asked, and I tried to probably oversimplify it a bit. Does that help? That, that is helpful. And I guess I, just one quick follow-up there, then if we're talking about a persona, like would you say a good way to describe a persona in those early days as you're iterating the words, it would be like, you know, that situation, pain and impact. Yeah, so let, me, like, I'll, let me visualize it out. Let me give everybody a tool right now that they can use to build their own persona. Uh, when I first met Sari, she was a product marketer and it was one of her jobs to help create these things. But we were growing so fast, I couldn't wait for product marketing. And Sari was creating some amazing tools for us. One of the tools that she created was something that we now called a cue card. At the top left, you just have a picture of a customer, of like a real customer that fits this. So let's say this is going to be a cue card for the director of IT persona. You'd find somebody, Virginia Wolf. You just use her name, Virginia, here. And now what this does is this keeps like, ah, this is a real person. You put other titles for what this could be, VP of IT, um, other people that you think would fit into that you could find on LinkedIn, but you just get a snapshot. Who is this person? Then you have, what is the situation that they're in? What's their day in the life? What do they care about? What dashboards do they look at? Where are they spending their time? Then you start filling out, what are their pains? at least get to three. What are the three in priority order pains that they are currently dealing with right now? And you can go into impact here, but what I really suggest for most prospectors is learn one story about that persona, a success story. And all you would do is say, hey, that reminds me of Virginia. She's a director of IT just like you. One of the biggest challenges that she was struggling with is scaling up the many different tools that her team was using and trying to bring it in under one umbrella. The impact that she found after working with a solution that put all of those tools under one security login, it allowed them to have more control, minimize any sort of risk from hackers, and she ended up increasing the safety record compared to other companies like her by 30%. I totally lost it at the end there, but that's how you would tell that story. Make it about Virginia, make it about the pain that she had, how she solved it. And then you sound like an expert because you're working with people like me and I wanna go deeper. So that's the cue card and then how you turn that into a story. I'm super short on time for today's workshop. So I'm gonna leave it there, Rahul. I'm sure you have more questions, yeah. but I wanna point people to resources. We have a YouTube channel. If you wanna learn more about this, check out the storytelling video on there. This will give you more details about how you can get started. And the whole reason I brought up Sari before is like as a sales professional, take control. Don't wait for marketing. Don't wait for your sales leader to write a persona card. Like you do it, spend the time, write this out. It's super simple exercise. Most people don't do it. And the quote to help support the argument that I'm making right now, one of my favorite quotes is by Jerry Rice. He says, I will do today what other people don't, so tomorrow I can achieve what other people can't. And by investing in yourself right now, by doing things like this, creating your own persona cards, like you're going to be in the top 1% of prospectors that do that. So invest the time, do something that other people won't, so one day you can achieve what other people can. Josh, over to you, um, sir. Question about uh, the, the size of like, four word subject lines, two lines to get their attention, kind of give me your conversation around, you know, the size of the email, because usually you have to grab their attention on their phone, you know, when they get the notification. That's right. Okay. Let's do emails super fast. Also another video that I have, so I'm going to go very light on it right now, but if you want to go deeper, there's more resources on our website and on our YouTube. Um, the way that I think about emails Subject line, just like you said, like this one is super hard to be like, here's the rule what you should follow. I think the thing that is now close to all of us is we know we need to like take out those words that like definitely are gonna get filtered out by spam, like free trial or what, like all of that stuff, like don't put in the subject line. They say four to eight words. 
And making it something that captures their attention is powerful. So if you can customize it for them, if you use the word you in there, but trends for subject line are always changing. And so the best practice is to start testing it. The thing to know though, is that like you said, most emails are read on the phone and you have about 43 characters of like whatever you can write in the subject line before it goes to dot, dot, dot. And then the other thing that you see on the phone is your first line. And this is a common mistake that people have is like, they'll use the same opener in the subject line as in the first line of the email, but you have 83 characters of the first line. And that's what you do to capture attention. Somebody on LinkedIn just asked me like, hey, is video prospecting still alive? How does that affect open rates? And it's like, if you include a video link in your email, they won't, if they don't open the email, the video doesn't even matter. So your opening line needs to be captivating. And if you start off with something that's relevant about them, this is more likely for them to open it. Hey, I noticed on your recent CEO's announcement or based on your recent post on LinkedIn about blank, anything like that that captures their attention at the opening can be really valuable. If you don't have anything specific for the person, talk about a company announcement. If you can't find any information on the company, which would be super rare, but if that happens, talk about the industry and have an assumption going into it about why you think it matters to that particular person. The next part is the reward. I think this is a principle that goes into all communication, but if you want somebody to talk to you again, you have to make your current interaction feel good to them. And if we go back to what's in it for me, everybody like likes talking to people who make them feel good or make them better at their job or look at in front of their team. So this idea of a reward would be sharing a video, a case study, um, a statistic, like something that they can use that's valuable to them. Something that would not be a reward is like, I'm also getting a lot of these sequences is like, just bubbling this up. Did you get my last email? Thoughts on the above? Like all of those emails, like I think it's rooted in this misconception that you need six to 12 touches in order to convert somebody. But not having something of value in your email is a really low quality touch. And it just shows that somebody's on an automatic sequence. And I just don't think it treats people as like real humans. Like I'm not just a number in your system. Like if you wanna actually talk to me, like put in the time to get to know me. And I think that's such a weird mindset shift because a lot of leaders are still like, hey, I need to scale. I need to reach out to all these people. Sales is a numbers game. And so it can be really challenging if you're being told to do it one way. And now I'm suggesting like, ah, the customer centric approach or the more human centered approach is better. There might be some friction there. So there may be a blend and you can do some tests and like say, hey, boss, you told me to send out hundred emails. And I did that in like seven hours, but I spent an hour a day doing it like this. And I'm getting like more conversions this way. So I'd like to scale up my time. And so that could be a way to convince somebody. Opening the email, relevance. Second part of the email, reward. The last part of the email is the request. The mistake that I think most prospectors young in their career make is they're like, I get comped when I get a meeting booked. So therefore every email and every message needs to be a meeting request because if you miss hundred percent of the shots you don't take. And I get the argument, but if every single prospecting email I get has a meeting request in it. And if you know that an average executive in a fortune 500 company gets 173 emails a day, like 0% chance executives are going to take a 15 minute meeting out of their busy day with someone they don't know who has like a templated email to them. Like, so meeting requests don't work. If we're talking about making friends out of college, like you got to earn it, you got to put in the time. So early emails that I would send out wouldn't ask for meeting or for time, but it would be, is this relevant? Would you like to learn more? Is there something else that you're working on? and trying to end the request with one simple call to action that's not about time, not about meeting. And so that's my quick recommendation on how to write epic emails that executives love to receive. Dan, we have a question about the subject lines from JJ. JJ is asking, can you advise some examples on subject? I sort of suffer every time I have to decide which subject line will work. JJ, what kind of subject lines have you seen work? What subject lines do you like or that you're worried about? Give me an example to work with.
interest in your company name. Okay, so this one's a very interesting example. Interest in your company name. A problem that I've noticed in sales is that if you use words that sound good, but if you think about them, they're actually not that great, they can turn a customer off. Now, JJ, I don't want to say like this is what yours is, but let me give you like the dramatic example. I'd love to learn about your company. I used to say this all the time, but as I thought about it, I'd love to learn. Why would the customer care if a stranger would love to learn about you or your company? Like it is so clearly a sales centered phrasing that people turn it off. I'd love to learn. Like, I don't care if you would love to learn it. There's nothing in it for me. And so even if you say, well, I'd love to learn so I can give you more relevant info, it's still like, ah, oh, sounds a little bit salesy. So interest in your company is I think a short firm, uh, a short tinned form of I'm interested in your company. And if you start off with I, they don't care as much as if you start off with you, make it about them. What's the problem that they are dealing with? So your growth into 2023, your hiring strategy for next quarter, your onboarding approach for new salesperson. So changing the I to you is one of my favorite tricks to try and get your subject lines to be more captivating. But really the, the skill behind that is putting the customer first. Why would they want to open up your unit? Why would they want to keep building on it? And then you can come back from it. Um, so anyway, I... I don't want to get too trapped in emails because there's a lot that we can go through and it's like a whole like training thing on its own. Um, I do want to go to the next step of emails though, which is applied research, is how do you put the research that you found on somebody inside of an email or inside of a call? And I think this is where a lot of us struggle. If you go to my LinkedIn profile and you see what college that I went to, it's like, that's cool, but my college was big and there's like 50,000 people that went there per year. And it's like, oh, I also went to UCLA. It's like, cool. Like if we were at a bar in some like random spot in the world and you're like, wow, you went to UCLA, that's so cool. Like I'd be connected to you. You'd be like, yeah, everybody else. But now if I'm like living, it's like, it's not a good connection point. And so that's not a good research tool to use because it's not really something that I care about. It doesn't go back to, anything around impact of what my job is now or what I'm trying to solve. So applying research to any form of communication has to be relevant to what they're doing. So the questions you can ask is, if I am trying to provide them information, will it help them look good in front of their team or will it help them do their job better? And if you try and start off your communication and applied research based on there, then you'll start recognizing like, oh, I saw on Twitter that you play guitar. Like, unless they're selling guitars, probably don't put that in your prospecting email. And there's now like a very like rare chance, but it still happens sometimes where like, there's so much information out on the internet. Like you don't wanna come across as a stalker. I, on the flip side, like most people don't do any research. So like it's super rare to happen, but like if you notice somebody posting a picture of their kid's first birthday and you like mention that in a cold email, probably a little much, probably a little stalkerish. But if you, notice something that's relevant to their business or a recent accomplishment that they just did. For example, I talked about Beck Holland earlier. She just completed the New York Marathon. Like it's probably not really business related, but you shouting that out based on a post that she made, that shows that you know something about her, that you took a little time to get to know her. And that really earns a lot of credibility for starting a conversation with somebody. Sorry, before we go into the next topic, is there anything else on emails? Um, on emails in particular, no, I'd say let's move on and then uh, I'm, I'm keeping track of these questions and we can come back to a couple of them later. Okay, cool. So let's go into applied research. I want to get into calling. Many of us have like love-hate relationships with cold calls. Um, I love them. The trend is that I think it's like somewhere above 90% of unknown calls to cell phones today are done by robots. And that sucks for us because if you're a real person calling somebody, like that's really challenging. The other trend that I've noticed is like, okay, when I was a kid, I always got like super excited when somebody would come knock on the door. Like my mom would always have like an extra cake that we weren't allowed to 
eat on the counter because like in case somebody came over, we'd have something for them to like eat and offer. And so like whenever somebody came on the door, it's like, oh my gosh, she's there. But now it's like, if somebody doesn't text me that they're going to like ring my doorbell, I'm like, hide the wife, hide the kids. Like who's there? Like I'm peeking out of the thing. Like I'm not expecting an Amazon delivery. And so like this fight or flight response that we have, like is still there, but it's probably even worse now for cold calls because unless you're calling into a sales leader, they're probably even more reluctant because of all of these robo calls that are like blocking our mojo. Like, so we have to get beyond that, but it means just like emails with a tough market, you still have to do it, but you still have to be more skilled in doing it. It's not just enough to do like an attempt at it. You have to like do it really well. And so one of the best ways that I've noticed how to do this is answer the questions that people have right when you call them. So I'm going to give away what the system is because I want to get into like what people really, I think what really blocks people from wanting to do cold calls, which is like the objection. What do they say first? And we're going to get into that in a second. Actually, I have a video queued up, so we'll get there. Whenever somebody calls you out of the blue, you need to answer these three questions because if you don't proactively answer them, they're thinking it to themselves. And so they're not really listening to what you're saying. They're just trying to see like with whatever your opening line is, does it solve it? The first question is, who is this? It's like, is my, so as, as you guys can pick up, like what's top of mind for me and the examples I'm giving, like I got two young kids at home. They just started school. So like, that's my mindset right now. The unknown, no, an unknown number calls me. I'm like, are the kids okay? Do they have to go to the hospital. Are they sick? Like, that's like the first thing on my mind. So like, who is this? Is this one of their teachers? Then I go in like, why are you calling? And this is the part where sales professionals can sound like experts. Hi, this is Jill. I'm calling from Outlook. The reason that I'm calling is that I noticed a lot of your competitors are using Gmail as their email client, but Outlook's got a really amazing new program with Windows help. I can't even finish that. But why the why you're calling needs to be about them. What's in it for them? Because that segues to what is the value they're going to get on this? Why you're calling is like the trigger. Like you notice something that they posted. You notice something change in the industry. Um, like this is the reason you're calling today instead of like in three months or three months ago. But the what's in it for me is like a short one sentence thing that you can't wing. Like I just tried and I failed at winging it. The what's in it for me, you need to write down before your call. What is this person going to expect out of the call? And the what's in it for me could be like, this is what a competitor is doing or somebody else in your position is doing, or here's a trend that's going on. And can I ask you two questions about that? See if it's relevant. If you start off the cold call and you say something like, oh, hey, are you got some time right now to chat? Everyone's gonna say like, no, I don't got time. Like nobody's waiting around for cold calls unless you're me, like looking for like how people open them. Like nobody has time for a cold call. So don't ask that question because you'll immediately get deflected. But who you are, why you're calling, what's in it for me? This is like a 20 second opener. And I call it an unscheduled call. Somebody in the chat earlier like mentioned something. It's like, oh, I don't make any cold calls because like they're all friendly. It's like based on the research that you're doing, all of your cold calls shouldn't really be cold. They should be warm. You should know something about them. Three things in three minutes. Have this documented, make it easy to reference. Pull up their LinkedIn profile as the call is ringing. So if they call it up, you can try and like get reacquainted to them. That's how you start off an unscheduled cold call. But I want to digress. We got something to talk about, which is like, let's say you nail it. Let's say you like nail this opening and you've earned a couple more seconds on the call with them. What do we all worry about is going to happen next? Carlos, I can feel you itching to go for that unmute, unmute button. You do the opening. What are we worried about with cold calls? Being brushed off. Being brushed off. We got objections versus deflections. And actually, I don't want to. Oh my gosh. You know how when you try and share something and Zoom updates and you didn't ask it to update and then it makes you download something? Super annoying. I'm going to share something that um, KD and I put together, which would be like, how do we actually handle 
much about the first like minute or so of this video. I want to just give an example of what that would sound like. Let's get into the specifics about how to actually solve the objections. The one that we hear all the time is, I'm not interested. How would you go about solving that one? Not interested is just a deflection. What it means is they assume they know what you do and they assume they know what you want. And so we need to get ahead of that assumption. So the key to handling a not interested objection is no one's interested in your product, but they are interested in solving problems. So we need to be ready to ask a question back saying, well, but do you deal with these problems? Of course, you're not interested, right? I called you, but having your question ready of, well, but do you struggle with these types of problems? Because then it might be worth the conversation. I love that. You're showing the double A technique in action. Okay. I haven't talked to you about the double A technique, but that's what we're going to, okay. I'm going to end with that. Like the last tool thing, cause I'm giving you a lot of like three letter acronyms to like remember and go through it. And I'm not a big fan of TLAs, but this is the best way that I've learned for us to recognize patterns and start applying it. But more importantly, how we can hold each other accountable to get better. If we expect a certain process, it's easy for us to improve it. So the double A technique that's in our new prospecting course of like the easiest way to handle objections versus deflections is acknowledge what somebody says. Whenever somebody gives you an objection, what you just heard KD go through, it's like, of course you're not interested right now. That's acknowledging what they said. This is diametrically opposed to what I used to always do. And I probably still do like with my family members when they say something that I don't like, I kind of just like ignore it and I steamroll by it and I pretend they didn't say that thing. But the problem with doing that, especially in sales, is that thing that they said is still in there. If you don't acknowledge it or solve it, like that yellow flag will turn into a red flag or they'll still keep getting like secretly angrier and angrier and just like wait for the moment to be able to like hang up the call. But acknowledging it is an empathetic approach. It's a very powerful listening technique that's rooted in mirroring. There's a difference in listening versus hearing. One is biological. You recognize the sound waves that go in. If you speak the same language, you understand the words that they're saying. Mirroring implies active listening. And this taps into a subconscious thing. I don't know what to describe. It's like it, it's subconscious, but like when somebody speaks in a way that shows they like listened specifically to what you just said, you naturally like that person. Innate. That's what I'm looking for. You have an innate desire to feel heard. And so when you mirror somebody, it shows that you heard exactly what they said. So when Rahul brought up personas, for example, I mirrored personas back to him. I made sure that I used his words in my answer so that he felt heard and I wasn't just like giving him a boilerplate answer. This technique is really powerful in handling objections or deflections. Use what they said within the context and acknowledge, make them feel like, all right, I understand where you're coming from. I understand what you just said. And then the second step of the double A technique is ask. And unlike we, how we learned in school, there is such thing as a bad question. So not all questions are fair here, but when you get great at asking questions, you naturally start getting people to open up. I'm sure you've experienced the same thing I have, which is like, sometimes when people talk, other people are like, oh, wow, like that person's so interesting. Or they, they start like opening up. And when others, like talk to like, uh, or like when you do it, like uh, no one's really listening or answering me or it's like very short. And like, why do some people get like great responses and why do I get bad responses? Typically, if you apply mirroring techniques within the question or you ask a question that like demonstrates expertise, then you're gonna get a better answer. For simplest answers, like what is your role at winning by design? That's an awful question because it takes five seconds to look it up on LinkedIn. So if you ask somebody what is their role at the company, they're gonna try and get off that phone as soon as possible. But if you open up and say like, hey, Rebecca, I noticed that you were marketing manager for the last five months at Figma. And one of the things, and now it's all, all of a sudden context in there. So you could say one of the things that I've learned is that marketing manager can mean a lot of different things in different companies is one of the things that you're working on blank. That question shows you've done research. You're not just telling somebody, 
like, oh, hey, I did a lot of research on your company. Because I get a lot of those emails too. It's like, hey, I was looking at your profile and I think it's great. I just wanted to ask you some questions on, it's like, no, you didn't look at my profile because you would have said something more thoughtful or like, anyway, a lot of people say they've done research when it's very clear that they haven't. So this is the best technique that you can use to insert any objection or deflection. The final thing that I wanna go into, I know I already said final, but it's like within this topic is rejection. Does anybody, has anybody gotten rejected on a call recently? What does that sound like? And it always doesn't feel good, no matter how I, long you've been doing sales. I think one of the things that, you know, this time of year, a lot of folks, depending on the industry, business, you know, their, their books are closed. IT is not approving any new software. You know, it essentially November and December are two week long months. Most of your C-suite folks are on vacation, things like that. So um, it's a lot of not until next year, call me in January, those types of rejections where they just, they kind of kick the can. And I know I didn't define them properly. Like I totally understand what you're saying, Thomas. What you just described though, they kicking the can, that's a deflection. I don't have time oh, right okay. now. We're not making this decision until January. Like call me back in three months. Those are all deflections. For me, the rejection, like, and so you would handle that, like acknowledge, like, yes, I understand that many of the C-level is in there. And if you have a critical event that you could point to, like, why doing it now is important. Like, is your budget cycle starting in January? Does it close up? Do you have an issue of like, if you don't use it, you lose it. So there's ways to try and tie it to a critical event, but you're exactly right. This is a super tough time of year to do that. Rejection in my definition would be like, how did you get this number? Never call me or anybody at my company again. Or like, I never want to hear from you or like, take me out of your system. Like, it's that, like you feel it. Like it's aggressive. They're like, it's sometimes personal, but it's never really about you. But a rejection, like, don't ever call me again. The way that you handle that has to be different than like acknowledge, like, oh, I understand you never want to. It's like, if you responded like that, they'd be like super mad, right? It's like triggered. It's like telling somebody who's mad to calm down. Like opposite thing always happens. I don't know why people think that that works. Like to actually make somebody calm down, you have to make them feel inherently listened to. If somebody rejects you, you try and immediately understand what they're saying and say, I'm gonna put this in action. Hey, I understand you're asking to be taken off the system. I'm personally gonna go into our system and mark you as do not contact. And so that way, nobody else at my company will. I'm gonna follow up to this call with an email, not to sell you anything, but with my personal cell phone number. And if somehow somebody does continue to contact you, please let me know to that email and I'll take care of it. And that's it. What do you think the beauty of that type of response is? Because they don't expect that. Most people who are rejecting you are like saying, oh, I don't like salespeople. And they like come ready to fight and you like completely acquiesce, acquiesce. What do you think that does to the relationship? It doesn't always happen. But a beautiful thing that can happen is like once that person comes back and they realize that they were being a little bit aggressive at the wrong person and that you're actually a kind professional person, they oftentimes will write you back an email and say, hey, sorry, or hey, thanks for understanding or appreciate you taking care of it. Like once they come down, they're out of that emotional fighting state. What you just did is that you didn't feed into it. A lot of times when there's friction or conflict, people expect patterns. It's like you flex and they flex back. Like you get like into that mode. But if you break the pattern, people are caught off guard. They still might not respond to it right away, but they'll think about it and they'll remember you in a positive light and you have a much better chance of getting me in touch with them than if you try and steamroll it and move past it or pretend like this is just an objection that you can handle. So anyway, I hope the, the way that we've defined that, the acknowledge and ask for re, uh, objections and deflections and how to be slightly different for rejection, that's a helpful toolkit that you can use to get around any nervousness that you have around doing unscheduled calls. The final thing that I mentioned at the very beginning is like, let's just touch very briefly on what the future is. What is like the exciting things that's happening in sales? And if everything else that we've talked about so far, you're like, hey, super easy to do. Like, I got this. I do emails, calls, LinkedIn stuff all the time. Like, I'm good. The future of what we're seeing starting to really work and elevate the profession is starting to think about how to sell through communities. 
If you think about your customer, where they're finding information, one of the last places that people will admit to wanting to find is like, oh, I'll just call up a salesperson. I'll just like reach out to them and like get pitched on their product. Like people hate being sold, but they still love to buy. But communities really work. If you think about even Amazon, like a super open community, but like when you're buying something on Amazon personally, like you go to the reviews and you see like what people are actually saying about it. Are their recent reviews one star, three star or five star? Are they talking about like, oh, I was between this one and that one and I chose this and it was a great choice. Those types of communities where people are talking about or recommending things, that is where prospectors can get involved. Where are the buyers going to discuss with each other? Now, the interesting thing about getting into these networks or communities, especially as a seller, is that you can't go in there and sell. And this is why we're calling it an advanced technique. Because if you're using it to try and pitch your solution or project, like they're going to reject you because you sound salesy and no one wants to get sold to. So the way that you add value to these communities is try and connect people. If you notice that there's one thread or there's one solution people are asking for and you provide that info, now you become a value added asset. And then you can convert that into a conversation that then eventually maybe your solution will come up. But the mindset that I hope you all leave with today is the route to being an excellent salesperson is not just selling your solution, it's helping your customer buy. You're helping diagnose what they're really struggling with. And we hope, all of us are working for companies that we believe in, otherwise we wouldn't be working there. But it might not be right for everybody. Or in fact, it's not. No solution out there is right for everybody. And so helping customers evaluate trade-offs, that's where you become valuable. And because your LinkedIn profile, your social success is rooted in how you network, don't be so short-sighted to only use LinkedIn for this one job that you have. Like we all are gonna work in multiple jobs, maybe even multiple industries or careers in our life. And so if you think about the way that you add value to people through helping them solve problems, this will help you be a successful salesperson, even if in the short term, you're not gonna sell them. But no is the second best answer that you can get into sales and getting to know quickly is sometimes really valuable. Helping people find the solution is what it's all about. Thank you everybody for joining. We will follow up with the recording. We'll send over some resources on where you can go deeper since we definitely didn't have enough time to go through everything I was hoping to today. But thank you for the engagement and for a few of you going on video. Um, that was really delightful. So thank you everybody for joining. Have a great rest of the week.